This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. By this time, you know that I start off with this verse every week. So I want us all to recite it together. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Meet me in your Bibles this morning uh, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. This is in the New Testament. Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 39 is our text for this morning. And as you're finding your ways there to Luke, uh, in my Bible it's, it's on page 10, 000, well, 1024. 1024. The, the current series we're on is, is gospel-centered. Everyone say gospel-centered. Gospel-centered. And we've made an acronym, our preaching team, uh, the wisdom of Larry, uh, and a little wisdom from me, and a lot of wisdom from God. Uh, we have made an acronym. So, do you remember the acronym? It starts with G. G is for God. And then O is for others. S is for sacrifice. P is for proclamation. E is for eternity. And L is for love. Have we all memorized that? Okay, yes. we need to memorize that. God, others, sacrifice, proclamation, eternity, love. And we have been going through each of those letters, and today we have come to what? P. P, correct. Thank you, Martha. Proclamation. Proclamation. Uh, the gospel-centered life is a proclamation-centered life. So we proclaim the goodness of Jesus Christ. And through today's text, I want us to find out the reason why, and... Um, and to see how we can proclaim uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. So, have we all found the text for today? Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. If you have, say gospel. gospel. Please rise with me then as I read God's word. Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take a seat. Father God, we come in your Son's precious name as your Holy Spirit illuminates our hearts to understand this word, this truth, this reality. That you would shine 
a spotlight into the depths of our hearts and that all darkness would flee in Jesus name that all anxiety will go in Jesus name that all sickness in our bodies will leave in Jesus name and that the peace of God would reign supreme in our hearts father God we ask in Jesus name that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be pleasing unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And as we hear from heaven this morning, may we be refreshed, renewed, and may the revival fire continue to burn deeply within our hearts so that we may bless this region, this nation, and all over the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your precious, mighty, and strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, this week I had the privilege of uh, going to uh, Niagara Falls. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we actually had the privilege of going over to the Canadian side. There is an American side and there's a Canadian side. And uh, we, we had uh, guests from um, our home church, our partner church in Korea, so we wanted to show them. And we, we went over there. It's, it's a short drive, maybe about seven and a half hours over there. And <laughs> Sarah and I, we, we drove uh, in turns and we went there. And on the way back, um, you know, we, we ran out of petrol, you'd say gas. So I drove into a petrol station and there was a big lorry coming in. And, and I thought, well, I, I need to make space for this lorry. So I began to back up and I began to back up and then thud! Uh oh. So I put my car in drive and I drive a little bit forward, I put my emergency signal on and I come out to the, the minivan which we had rented. If it was my car I'd be okay with a thud, but it's something that I borrowed. Did you know that feeling of, oh no! So I, I went out and um, the, the gentleman from the truck behind me came out to see if there was any damage and he was touching his truck and I was looking at mine and I said, sir, are you okay? He says, I, I'm okay. So I go to his car and I ask if his family's okay and they said they're okay and, and I said, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Um, I, I was just backing up and he said, well, let's see if there's any damage. But there was a big thud so I knew there was going to be damage. He's touching his car and he's looking at my minivan, he's looking and he's like, there's, there seems to be no, no marks here, no damage at all. And he says to me, since there's no damage, you can go. And, um, I said, are you, are you sure? Can we just check one more time? <laughs> <laughs> he, he said, it's okay, it's okay, you can, you can go. I said, I'm extremely sorry, I apologize. Please accept my apologies and we shook hands and left. And as I was driving off, a, a gentle voice impressed upon my heart that as the thud, as I was going back, God's hand was right in between those two vehicles. Because how could there have been that big of a big noise? And everyone felt it, there was a jolt, thud. And yet God's hand was protecting us and also them. And I want to proclaim today that the God who was with Abraham, Isaac, who, the God who was with David, the God who was with Moses, the God who was with Daniel and his friends, the God who was with Esther and Ruth, the God who was with Jonah, the God who was with us is still as powerful as he was from even the beginning of time and even before time, he is still living and active. And I want to proclaim and declare that he's alive. Amen. He's alive and well. He's alive. And I give praise to God because I was thinking, oh no, how, how much do I have to pay for repairs and things like that? All of those thoughts were rushing in my mind and yet but God in his grace, in his mercy, saved us from that ordeal and we were not hurt, and that's a good thing as well. When good things happen, we share. When we taste good food, we share. When you see something good on social media, you either press like or share, and you, you do something with it, you cannot help but act. 
And today we find a person that has tasted the goodness of God in this story. And his name is not mentioned. But he has met Jesus. And Jesus has freed him. And what does he do? He goes. And we find in Mark a different account of the same story. That he goes to the Decapolis, which means ten cities, to share the good news. Not one. Not two. But to ten. He goes out and shares the good news. He proclaims the good news. In the Greek, it is keruso, which means to proclaim and to preach. And that's what this man does. But the goodness of God. So I look at our lives today, and I see us as evangelists and sharers of the gospel and proclaimers of the good news. And I wonder if the good news is really good news for us because of the lack of the sharing aspect of our lives. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but just be reflective as you hear God's word today, because I want us to be reminded that if something is really good, if you know that you've been brought from death to life, if you know that you've been rescued from darkness to light, if you know that you were headed on a broad way towards destruction, but through the cross of Jesus Christ and believing in Him, that you have been led to a narrow road into eternal life, then we have a message to share. Amen. It has to come out of us. In our expressions, in our countenance, in our words, in our actions, in the things that we invest time in, our money in, it has to show. Yes. So keep that in mind as we hear God's word. The first observation I want to share with you this morning about this man whom we will call the demoniac or the person that was possessed. I, I see this person in, in a state of being, a spiritual state of being expressed in physical form. If you're writing this down, do it right now. A spiritual state of being expressed in physical form. How do I notice that? Well, look with me in verse 27. Verse 27, when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. A person, imagine, imagine with me, imagine with me a person with no clothes, don't imagine too hard, but just no clothes, no clothes, no home. Right? The hair's all like messed up and the face is all, all dirty and facial expression is all growly. And living in a place where dead people are buried in the tombs. Can you just imagine that for a minute? Wow, that's horrendous. It's not a pretty sight. Sorry? It's not a pretty sight. Not a pretty sight. That's right, Lauren. A person that is just possessed by something, spirits, that would lead this person to a life of hopelessness, correct? And then, look with me in verse 29, they, they try to seize him with chains, hand and foot. I mean, this is a human being, by the way, but they try to seize him and control him with chains, but he would break those chains with strength, and then the, the evil spirits would drive him to solitary places in verse 29, we find. All right, no clothes, no house, living in tombs. They tried to seize him with chains with no success and driven to solitary places. This is inhumane. This is torture. And I believe the outer expression of this man's life is the actual reality of his spiritual well-being. No clothing, so not robed with Christ's righteousness, as we learn from God's word. No house, for my house will be called uh, a house of prayer for all nations, so he has no home to go to. Living in tombs, no community. 
being uncontrollable, uncontrollable. And when we find that the Holy Spirit in His fruit of the Spirit gives us what? Self-control. All of these things, I find a spiritual reality in this man's life. But what about our lives? Do we sometimes feel lonely? Sometimes feel defeated? Tread upon? People cut you down with their words? People try to compare you, your job makes more, <coughs> my job makes more money than your job, and they try to compare things. The world and the evil spirits will continue to try to bring you down. And we experience those things. And this man, the demon-possessed man, has experienced this. Let me go one step further. What about the demon-possessed man's parents, if he had any? What about his father? Let's imagine he had a father. Obviously, he probably had an earthly father. What would happen on Father's Day for this father as he thinks about his child? His child that no one can control. His child that has no clothes. His child that is uncontrollable. His, his child that lives in tombs. How the father longs for this child to come home. Oh, I long for my child to come home with me. So that I can love him. So that I can clothe him. Brush his hair. And wash his face. And give him a bath. And give him some good food. Cut his hair. Nails. And I believe as we see this text, we, we also recognize the heart of the Father. But then Jesus steps into the picture. Jesus did not have to go there, but he did. Jesus did not have to go to this region of the Gerasenes, which is now very close to the country of Jordan. He did not have to go, but he enters the situation. Do you sense excitement already? Jesus enters the situation of this man's impossibility, of this man who is ravaged by the evil spirits, and he has no hope. Maybe he has no control over his body or his language. But Jesus enters. We must recognize that even in our deepest pit of darkness and despair, Jesus is willing to come into that situation. Amen. So let's look at verse 30. Jesus steps in, and what does Jesus say to this person? Verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the man replied, legion, or in other words, mob, mob. Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. You see, in that day, legion is the highest, uh, well, the, the largest form of a Roman army. Up to 6,800 people are in a legion. So if a legion of evil spirits has come into this man, Wow, that's a lot of demons. Do you know why that happens? Because darkness begets darkness. When you have dirtiness, flies will come all over that dirtiness. If you have dung in your, please don't have dung in your uh, living room, but if you do, you will find that it will smell and that it will attract other dirty things. So maybe for this demon-possessed man, it started with one small thing. But that sin begets another sin, begets another sin, and the darkness attracts darkness, and it becomes to a point of him not being able to even control his will. And yet Jesus asks that question, what is your name? And he answers, legion, mob. I am the mob. And they... They are afraid of Jesus, and they recognize Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Even evil spirits recognize Jesus. Look with me. 
verse 28, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. Now, Jesus doesn't want to torture the evil spirits. It's like a victim mentality. You're going to torture me. You're going to do harm to me. When Jesus isn't even thinking about that. Jesus is going to place order where there is disorder. And this is what's going to happen to this man. There is going to be order when Jesus speaks. And that's what he did. For Jesus, verse 29, commanded the evil spirits to come out of men. I love Jesus in that Jesus sees this man who is suffering. Suffering from evil spirits. And Jesus commanded the evil spirits to come out of this man. By his word, disorder becomes order. Wow. Jesus is so powerful. He's amazing. And yet he's so gentle and meek. That's the Lord who has saved me. That's the Lord who carried the cross up on that hill of Calvary. That's the Lord who bled for you and me. That's the Lord who was raised again. That's the Lord who is still living right now, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us and his people right now. That's the kind of Lord we serve. So do you have despair? Do you have anxiety? Do you have fears? Today is the day that you lay it down before the cross and say, Jesus, speak into my life. And he will, and he has, and he will never let us go. And then I find another very interesting point in this story. The, the evil spirits say, send us into those herd of pigs. And in Mark, it, this is about 2,000 plus pigs, okay? Uh, back in the day, ancient Near East, bit of background. Pigs are dirty animals. Only the Gentiles would raise them. But pigs had a lot of value. Okay, let's do a little math question for Aiden and Anthony right here. 2,000 pigs, if one pig was worth $3. Three times $2. 6,000, yes, 6,000, thank you, Alex. If one pig was worth $5 and there were 2,000 of them, how much are they worth? 10,000. And I'm sure they were worth much more than that. That's a lot of money. But when the evil spirits went into the pigs, what did they all do? A lot of bacon went down the drain. <laughs> but don't take this lightly. That is the characteristic of the evil spirits. They are here to steal, kill, and destroy. Wherever they infiltrate, what they want to do is they want to steal your joy, they want to kill you, and they want to drive you away from the love of God. And that's why God says to us, be holy, for I am holy. Yes. So there's no room for the evil spirits and evil ones to tempt us into sin. And listen, sin is no good. Sin is bad. It's not good for you. Remember, darkness begets darkness. Darkness begets darkness, but when the light of the world, Jesus Christ, shines through that darkness, the darkness has to flee. There is no more room. If any of you are struggling with sin today, make today the day that you get rid of it. Say no. Come to Jesus. Repent of your sins. And you might say, well, Pastor Elisha, other churches don't preach repentance. Well, uh, I am not sorry, because my Bible... My, my Lord wants us to live holy lives. And the only way to come back to him is through confession and repentance and through the blood of Jesus Christ only. Preach it, brother. <laughs> so what other message do we have to preach besides the message of Jesus crucified on the cross? He bled for you so that he could cleanse us and reconcile us to the Father. Remember the picture. I want you to remember this picture. The cross of Jesus Christ signifies something. And Brother Larry, by God's anointed wisdom, was able to share this with me. That in one hand, he holds all humanity. Sinful man 
sinful people. And with his death, with his blood, he holds the right hand of our holy God. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And with his life, he reconciles this relationship, this intimate relationship, and brings us together. So every time you see the cross, you must be reminded of the goodness and the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God and the joy of God and the price that God paid so that we may receive grace freely. Listen, for us, grace is free, but for God it wasn't. It cost him his son, his one and only. Listen to me, sin is bad. Listen to me, come out from darkness. Hear me today because I love you. That God wants relationship with you, an intimate one. He wants to protect you and he wants to be for you and defend you. He wants you to come home. Will you let him? So when Jesus speaks into this man's life, something changes in him. The demons are driven away. And there is a transformation. What happens? Look with me. Same chapter. Verse 34 to 36. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. Obviously, the, the pig herders, they weren't very happy with what happened. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man, the same man, the demon-possessed man, but now from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet. That's the first thing we ought to do. Sit at Jesus' feet. He was dressed, no longer naked. He is dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Hallelujah. There is a cure. There is a bond in Gilead. There is healing for the sick. There is healing for the broken hearted. Let Jesus in to that picture, into that situation. Verse 37. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. And this is another point I want you to remember. The gospel is offensive. Everyone say, the gospel is offensive. When Jesus steps into the picture for the demon-possessed man, and maybe for his family, it was a good thing. He's free, right? But what about the pig herders? They lost, as I said, a lot of bacon. They lost a lot of money. But what they are thinking about is money. What Jesus is concerned about is the person. Amen. Because even if you had $10,000 or $100,000, can you buy a soul? No. Never. God is more concerned with that person. And many of us, we live our lives as if $10,000 or a million dollars will just settle everything for us. No. Jesus is the only way that will give you true freedom and liberty and everlasting life. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. I've repeated this verse maybe every time I've come up to preach, but it's so important. John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's Jesus. Amen. Only through the cross. Only through the cross. So if you are banking your lives on money, prestige, fame, power, listen. It's not going to give you eternal life. You're not going to take your ten cars, your ten houses, or your ten PhDs. You will leave all that behind. But the hope we have as followers of Jesus Christ is that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Amen. And yes, the gospel is offensive. So people, when they say to you, stop talking about Jesus, that's natural. Don't be offended by them. 
It's like this, if you've been in a dark room for such a long time and suddenly there's light, how do you feel? Oh. It's the same thing if you are talking to a person that cannot see and you're explaining something, they can't see it. it it's something not to be offended by. It's something that you would just embrace them and say, okay, I still love you, man. I still love you. I'm praying for you. But God is more interested in the person. And now we come to the first missionary commission, as it were, verse 38 to 39. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This man who had no clothes, who was demon-possessed, living in tombs, uncontrollable, is now in a same state of mind, clothed, and now he's able to think and he sees Jesus clearly for the first time. And what does he want to do? I want to follow Jesus. But Jesus had a mission for this man, not to follow him as one of his disciples, but to follow him as a disciple that is sent to the mission field. And then he begins to share the good news. Now, humor me, did this man go to seminary? Did this man have a, a degree in Bible? Did this man like have a really close relationship with Jesus? I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe he stayed with Jesus for a couple of days. But I would say that his biblical knowledge wasn't too deep. I would present to you that maybe this man didn't have such high education. Why? Because this man was demon possessed. So maybe he was a dropout. Maybe you would consider this man to be someone that is very lowly of stature. Yet he had one message and the gospel of Jesus Christ was enough for him. What was his message? I was lost. Jesus stepped into my life and spoke life into me, and now I'm found. That was his message. And maybe he would add a bit more. When I was lost, I was uncontrollable, I would harm people, I would growl at people, and I was, I was just a very mean person. That's who I used to be. And, but Jesus stepped into my life and spoke life into me and liberated me from that darkness. And now I'm sharing this good news with you so that you may know Jesus. That's his story. Do you have a story this morning? Do you have a story? How many times has God given you grace and defended you from calamity? How many times has God helped you through tough times? God, help me just get through this test. And as soon as he helps you, you forget about him. One of the things that has helped me in my walk with Jesus Christ is proclamation. Everyone say proclamation. In my heart, I knew that God wanted, to, wanted me to live a holy life. In my heart. And that's what I wanted. But the reality was, I was tempted left, right, and center. The tempter comes. And every time I was tempted, my mentor would say, Proclaim that you are a child of God, that you are a saint, that I am a holy man of God. I have a call upon my life to preach the good news. So that's what I would do. Every time temptation would come, you know, thoughts, pride, lust, slander. Do you know what I would do? I would stand up and I would say, get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I am a child of God. I am called to preach the holy gospel of Jesus Christ. And I would just proclaim it. And do you know what happened? Every time, that thought will flee. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And when light comes, darkness has to flee. That's the natural thing. So I would proclaim it. 
And that's what I would submit to you today. If you struggle, proclaim Jesus at that point of struggling. Don't just meditate on the temptation. Oh, oh that seems good. Well, let me just go a bit more. Uh, and then you find yourself at the ledge of Niagara Falls. Do you know that feeling? And that's not where he wants you to go. When that temptation comes, you proclaim that I am a child of God. And the blood of Jesus has washed me clean. And I am his. And he is mine. And I have a calling upon my life to proclaim the good news. Don't just think that's for Pastor Elijah. That's for all of you. Listen, this demon-possessed man, maybe perhaps the first missionary, didn't have an education. But he had the experience of Jesus coming into his life and setting him free. Many of us have experienced that. Has God set you free from addiction? Maybe smoking or, or drinking alcohol or, or drugs or any of those things? Proclaim it and say, thank you, Jesus. You have set me free. I am no longer bound by that sin, but you have set me free. Free indeed. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So do you have a Jesus story to share? What are you doing with it? Again, let me ask you, do you have a Jesus story to share? What are you doing with that story? Because I believe the story that Jesus has given you is your unique story that no one can say you're lying. It is a testimony of God's grace, truth, and love. And we give all the glory to Him. And that's why I love the words of Amazing Grace. It goes like this, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Do you see Jesus? Would you accept him into your hearts today? And if you have accepted him, will you live a life that proclaims the goodness of Jesus Christ? It doesn't have to be on this platform of preaching. It can be a market basket of you just smiling to that person next to you, or behind you, or the person who's just so slow. Dude, get up. Dude, get up. Dude. And although you may be frustrated on the inside, all you need to do is smile at them and say, you are doing a fantastic job. And if you could do that a bit faster, that'd be good for me, but that's okay. You know what? I, I respect that. You have this rhythm going. I'll, I'll, I'll prove to that. You know, you, you know I'll, our lives proclaim the goodness of God, people. Our lives. One word can make a difference in somebody's life. That's right. Just say something nice. I see hope in you, sister. Let the, let the goodness of God just ooze out of you. For when you squeeze an orange, what do you get? When you squeeze an apple, what do you get? When you squeeze a Christ follower, what do you get? The proclamation of the goodness of Jesus. So let us live the proclamation-centered life as this man, the demoniac, but now freed and the first missionary to the ten cities of the Decapolis. Wow. Wow. If God could do that for him, he can do that for you. He will do that for me. Let us continue to proclaim the goodness of our Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we recognize that no evil spirits, or even how many, or even 6,800 plus evil spirits, will leave at one word from Christ. That's how powerful you are. And they do not belong in the hearts and the minds of your creation. And we pray, Lord, that as we let Jesus into the scene, that we will proclaim the goodness of Jesus to live the gospel-centered life. And Father, many of us here 
are experiencing hardship this morning. A lot of pain, a lot of grief, a lot of uncertainty. And I pray that you would bind hope to each of their hearts right now in Jesus' name. And if the enemy has infiltrated into their hearts, sowing bitterness, sowing unforgiveness, sowing negative thoughts, Lord, we cast them out in Jesus' name right now. And we ask you to plant seeds of hope, seeds of grace, seeds of mercy, and overwhelm them and us with your love. Father, we recognize that we are weak, but you are strong, and we hold on to your promises this morning, and we proclaim the goodness of our God, that you are our defender, savior, and lover of our souls. May we not miss out on the goodness of who you are, and may you help us to obey your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.